And with Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hey, welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense and our hip news segment during the pandemic as we uh, are filming in our office. We usually do a live show on Friday nights, but uh, now we are recording this uh, earlier each week and then playing taped uh, news. But here is this week's news. We're gonna start with a story out of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Democratic Governor Ralph Northam has approved legislation, Senate Bill 2, or House Bill 972, decriminalizing marijuana possession offenses. Northam also recommended technical amendments which must be approved by the legislature before the new law takes effect July 1st this year. The law reduces penalties for offenses involving the possession of up to one ounce of marijuana to a civil violation punishable by a maximum $25 fine, no arrest, and no criminal record. Under current law, minor marijuana possession offenses are classified as criminal misdemeanors punishable by up to 30 days in jail, a criminal record, and the possible loss of driving privileges. According to data from the Virginia Criminal Sentencing Commission, more than 15,000 people were convicted for a first or second marijuana possession offense from July 2018 to June 2019, so in about an 11-month period. Uh, Virginians have long opposed the criminalization of personal marijuana possession, and Governor Northam's signature turns that public opinion into public policy. The new law also seals criminal records of past marijuana offenders from employers and school administrators and defines substances previously considered hashish as marijuana. Virginia patients will finally have access to medical cannabis products and explicit legal protections thanks to uh, this new legislation as well. Additional dispensing facilities, telemedicine, and programs registration for non-residents are among some of the many legislative improvements that Virginia's legislature was able to accomplish this year. In total, 16 marijuana-related bills succeeded in the 2020 Virginia Assembly. Our next story is from the federal government. Federal law enforcement agents and their partners made fewer marijuana-related arrests in 2019, but seized a far greater number of plants than they did the year before, according to an annual data compilation by the U.S. Drug Administration, Drug Enforcement Administration. According to figures published in the DEA's Domestic Cannabis Eradication Suppression Statistical Report, the agency and its law enforcement partners confiscated an estimated 4 million marijuana plants in 2019, up from 2.8 million in 2018. By contrast, marijuana-related arrests compiled by the DEA fell to 4,718 in 2019, a decrease of 16% from 2018's total. It was the second lowest number of arrests reported by the DEA in the past decade. In 2011, for instance, the DEA seized over 8.7 million marijuana plants and made over 8,500 uh, annual arrests as part of its nationwide eradication suppression activities. Our next story is from Olympia, Washington. Democratic Governor Jay Inslee signed legislation, House Bill 2870, into law offering targeted technical and financial assistance for disadvantaged populations seeking to enter the licensed cannabis marketplace. HB 2870 creates a new social equity program that provides businesses opportunities to uh, uh, people from disproportionately harmed communities so they can benefit economically from the cannabis industry and become a cannabis retailer, uh, the governor said in a prepared statement. The legislation acknowledges that those individuals who reside in communities that were most disproportionately impacted by cannabis criminalization face greater difficulties accessing traditional banking systems and capital for establishing their businesses. The measure therefore offers, among other things, financial and technical assistance and license application benefits to individuals most directly and adversely impacted by the enforcement of marijuana-related laws who are interested in starting 
cannabis business enterprises. Washington state voters decided to legalize the retail sale of marijuana to adults in 2012. Licensed retailers began operating in 2014. According to uh, data provided by the state's Liquor and Cannabis Board, an estimated 3% of retail cannabis providers and only 1% of marijuana production and processing facilities are majority owned by African Americans. Next story tonight's from Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, two of the state's five licensed medical cannabis access facilities have shut their doors, according to media reports there in Iowa. The closure leaves only three operating dispensaries left in Iowa and uh, only one licensed cultivation center. According to the Iowa Department of Health, an estimated 4,300 uh, patients are registered to access cannabis extract products. Under Iowa's law, those extracts must not contain percentages of THC in excess of 3%. Legislation advanced by the lawmakers last year to remove the low THC cap was ultimately vetoed by Republican Governor Kim Reynolds. Following the recent closures, Democratic State Senator Joe Bolcom said, quote, Iowa has the most bureaucratic, expensive, and ineffective program in the country, and we just got worse. More evidence is now in with two of our dispensaries essentially going out of business because it's not economically feasible, end quote. Under the state's access law, there can be no more than five licensed dispensaries operating in Iowa at one time. And that's the end of our hemp news segment tonight. Uh, we'll be back with a new show uh, and new hemp news segment next week. Thanks for watching. Help restore hemp. I was a battalion scout and point man, and any of you guys are veterans, you know what the hell a point man means. The life expectancy is about 30 minutes or so, something like that. And uh, I was in a war history writing class with about 10 Vietnam guys, and I told them that I was a point man and scout. They says, oh no, you weren't. And I says, god damn it, yes I was. And they says, nah, you weren't. If you were, you'd be dead. So. Here I am, mean as hell, and so forth. <clears throat> How many of you read the story in the Oregonian last week about the DEA trying to get hold of your patient's charts? How many of you raise your hands? You read that? Well, let me tell you, the DEA skunks and the local cops are all going crazy because you bastards have permits to use marijuana. And you have permits to grow it and you have permits to carry it, and you have permits to give it to somebody else and all that kind of stuff. And there are 15,000 of you guys with permits right now. 15,000 in Oregon. And about 7,000 uh, caregiver growers. So that makes about 22,000 people who have the permits right now. Now, this is, this is small potatoes because in California, there are over 300,000 people who have permits. Well, California, I understand, is a little bit larger than uh, Oregon. You, you don't mind if I say Oregon, do you? You know? Well, I lived this east of the Mississippi for about 20 years or so, and back there I was from Oregon. And that used to grate on my nerves. And so I finally figured out, thank God they've never been out here. Because if they ever say that in the state of Oregon, they'd get somebody hit them over the head of the brick. Yeah! Thank you, sir or madam. Uh, when the board uh, took away my license in November three years ago, um, I was really disgusted with this because they thought that they were punishing me. They were not punishing me, they were, they were punishing my 4,000 patients. And, and I, I, I got the idea that they were trying to stop the medical marijuana program. But as most of you know, the THC Foundation Clinic is probably seeing about 200 patients a week 
and we're increasing the number of patients all the time. Um, there are 2,200 doctors in Oregon now who are signing applications, 2,200 of them. And uh, some of you know, many of you don't know, I'm actually an osteopathic doctor. And believe it or not, there are 200 osteopathic doctors who are signing these applications. And I thought I was the only one. And uh, because I thought I was the only one, I was a real bad person. And that's one of the reasons why I'm wearing this cute thing right here. That I'm, I'm the most dangerous man in Oregon because it said so in the Oregonian. We love you. We love you, Dr. Buck. That, that reminds me, thank you very much, that reminds me of several years ago uh, on our television program a, a man phoned up and wanted to know if his medical condition would permit him to get a, a permit and so forth and, and so he told me what his medical condition was and I says, hell yes, I says, you're eligible, come on to the office and he says, Dr. Levesque, I'd like to have a relationship with you. And I said, if you don't mind, please don't say that on television. So uh, I hope you, you, t you two guys don't want to have a relationship with me because I, I gave all that stuff up. I, I, I was a Boy Scout till I was 14 and then I became a Girl Scout. Um, I have just uh, started uh, writing articles about medical marijuana the website is called salem-news.com and I try to write at least one article a week about all the sundry aspects of medical marijuana. What we're concentrating on right now is post-traumatic stress disorder. How many vets I got in the office here? You poor dumb bastards. <laughs> Don't volunteer for shit, that's all I have to say. <laughs> At any rate, even the Veterans Administration admits that they are failing to take care of post-traumatic stress patients, um, which, which is a real surprise because I was in the VA hospital about 50 years ago and they told my mother on three occasions that uh, we don't believe your son's going to make it. And I fooled them. And I survived, and then about two years later, <clears throat> I met one of my doctors in the hallway of the medical school, and he looks me up and down, he says, uh, you're Levesque, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I'm a Levesque. He says, well, are you a janitor here? And I says, no, I'm a PhD candidate. And he says, really? I says, what do you mean really? He says, we never thought you'd be normal again. So if any of you think that I'm normal, you're crazier than hell. <coughs> now, does it, do any of you have any questions of any something or other? I have, I have become one of the world's authorities on medical marijuana, so ask me anything. How do I qualify for, to get a card? Oh, okay. Uh, how, how, how bashful are you? Come up here and talk to me. Come on, get up here. In, in what? Uh, marijuana used for ADHD. Oh, very, actually, hey, that's a very good question. In fact, the matter is, uh, over the, uh, this past week, I wrote uh, two articles about ADD and ADHD. <clears throat> and the uh, California doctors... <laughs> oh, my wife could run by whose mouth? My mouth. Oh, okay. The doctors in California, and as far as I know, there are about 70 doctors in California who are writing these permits. But uh, just like I say, they have written over 300,000 by now. And the DEA and the local cops are going crazy down there because, well, what the hell, you're just a bunch of potheads and you don't deserve even the time of day. So ADD and ADHD are good. Now, I was invited. Uh, uh, back to a, to a subcommittee at Congress uh, three years ago 
uh, by Representative Souder from Indi Indiana. And he represented um, Eli Lilly and Company in Indianapolis, who had just developed a new ADD, ADHD drug. And so what uh, Souder wanted to do was to quash the medical marijuana in the United States completely. And so uh, I was invited back there and I was told by the Marijuana Policy Project that they were going to skin me alive. So I decided not to go. But the strain, now the, it, the Eli Lilly Company figured that the ADD drug would bring in a billion dollars a year. But after it was released and used for about six months, they found out it didn't work. Now this is really crazy because marijuana does work for kids and, and they don't smoke, but they eat it in cookies. How many of you are cookie eaters? How many of you are smokers? I don't know why the hell I asked that. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't. Well, that's not exactly true. About six years ago, my youngest son gave me a loaded bong for Christmas and he says, I'll dare you to light it up. Well, I think it was pretty bad grass or some goddamn thing. Probably Mexican mud, who knows, something like that. But anyway, I took a couple of hits off and I says, Jesus Christ, what, what's, what's so great about this stuff? He said, well, you're not taking enough of it. How many of you have heard that? How many of you ever been high? How many of you been high twice? What'd you say? How many guys have been high 37 years straight? <laughs> I think this is hilarious. <laughs> well, I will say, I will say that um, uh, when I became a graduate student at the medical school, the first thing the chairman says, Levac, go into the stock room and see if you can straighten it out. So I went into the stock room and the first thing that I found was a gallon jug of cannabis cough medicine. This was 13 years after it was declared illegal for anybody in the United States to have anything like that. And uh, I said, well, it's, it was made by Park Davis and Company, which is one of the largest in the world. And I poured myself a pint and I took it home and I tried it out and it works. And so I still have that pint someplace around my house and uh, I'll find it one of these days. But uh, that was the only time that I actually smoked marijuana at that time. But I, I have used the tincture and I've used the oil and they, they work fine for me. And uh, uh, how many of you ever had bad grass? Did you like it? Raise your hands if you enjoyed it. Didn't, didn't like it. Well, it's great that in uh, British Columbia they're growing some of the best grass in the world. <coughs> and uh, uh, some of the plants are being grown in the Portland area. You probably know that. How many of you know that? You know that? Very good. What do you want? This guy says he's going to cut my throat. So does anybody have any final question here to ask me? Don't get smart with me, fella. <laughs> Glad to be here. I'm going to turn around and give you all a very short, uh, very short picture of cannabis therapeutics. Take a look at it. Yeah. Isn't that more fun than it ought to be? Thank you very much. Do not smoke in the rain.
package. Yes.
what that's about. about 1910, this guy named Schlitikin, according to research by Don Wirtschafter, started inventing a machine that was like the cotton gin. It dropped the labor involved in hemp to a hundredfold from its previous price. It went from, I think, uh, uh, 50 cents a pound to half a cent a pound. And hemp became incredibly inexpensive. And when that happened, the petrochemical industry was just starting to synthesize petroleum to be like hemp seed oil and other vegetable oils to run diesel engines. And so at that time, petroleum wasn't the predominant fuel. Most people grew uh, 
their fuels, you know, their, their uh, illuminates, they called it, for their lamps before electricity, and they'd eat the stuff left over. And with hemp, they called it gruel, which uh, it was a pretty basic food that uh, was very high in the essential fatty acids, just like it is today. It's very healthy food. But the petrochemical industries realized that hemp was their main competitor, that hemp produced three times more seed oil than any other plant out there. And that's still true today. According to uh, a study out of Notre Dame that was published in a magazine called The Midlands Naturalist back in 1975, this article is called uh, Feral Hemp in Southern Illinois. According to that study, the wild hemp that was growing on the riverside in Southern Illinois produced four tons of seeds. When you take four tons of seed and you press it, you get 300 gallons of oil. Now that oil is not only very nutritious, it can also be put right into any diesel engine and with no conversion to the diesel engine, it can run your diesel engine. Now the other seed oil crops right now are soybeans, uh, sunflower seeds and canola are rapeseed. You know, it's rapeseed and then when they press it they call it canola oil. Each of those produce 100 to 120 gallons of oil per acre. And you know that's mainly what we're driving today when we're driving biodiesel vehicles. You're driving those seed oils, and it, you know, it runs the diesel engines just fine, as most of us know. But hemp is three times more productive, and the byproduct from making oil from hemp is three tons of high protein. You start with four tons of hemp seeds, you press it, you get 300 gallons of oil and four tons of high protein hemp seed meal. Yeah. So that's not the only thing you get. You know, just think if we. Just with that alone though, if we grew all of our fuel from hemp, all those barrels of oil, for every barrel of oil, there's 50 gallons, there's gonna be a half a ton of high protein hemp seed meal left over to wipe out world hunger. And then there's another byproduct, the fiber byproduct. You're gonna get about 25 tons of hemp herd fiber. Hemp herds also make paper. There's a bulletin from the USDA back in 1916. USDA Bulletin 404 by Lester Dewey. It's called Hemp Herds as a Paper Making Material. And that report said that hemp produces four times more paper per acre than trees. Well, that's a waste product when you're growing hemp for seed oil. And that waste product can make most of our paper needs and our building materials. You can glue that stuff together the same way they glue together wood fibers today. And then the other byproduct, not just is the herd fiber, but also six to eight tons of bast fiber. Now that's the highest quality plant fiber you can have. It's, made to, it's used to make canvas, rope, lace, and linen. And in fact, a lot of the antique linens and laces out there are made from marijuana stems, from hip uh, fiber. And so your average acre of hemp is gonna produce 300 gallons of oil, three tons of high protein hemp seed meal, 25 tons of hemp bast fiber for paper and building materials, and six to 10 tons of hemp uh, herd fiber, actually the herd fiber is the 25 tons, and the bass fiber is the 6 to 10 tons, but the bass fiber can be used to make canvas, rope, lace, and linen. And I think it's the seed oil that's the real key here. And that when we legalize marijuana and allow unregulated industrial hemp to become predominant again, the petrochemical industries are going to lose their market hold. We're gonna see a decentralization of the economy. We're not gonna see the money being sent to the sheiks and the oil companies, uh, the despotic governments around the world that depend on it in Nigeria and the Middle East. We're gonna see the money going to the farmers and to the local economy. And that's the key. That's what the petrochemical industry does not want. They want us to keep pouring our money into their industries that are capital intensive. It takes so much money to drill for oil, none of us can compete, and it takes billions of dollars, tens of billions, to refine petroleum into all the different products we use to make from it today. But hip seed oil and hip, you can 
You get a, a seed oil press for $2,000, and any farmer can get all the oil he needs to run his tractors, feed his family, and ship the rest to, to support the local energy market. And I look forward to the day when that's going to happen. You know, what we are really here working for today is to end adult marijuana prohibition. We want to end adult marijuana prohibition. We want to make it legal. We want to see it where it's legally sold to adults over the counter. We want to see it where adults can grow their own with no license whatsoever. I mean, why? you know, you don't need a license to make your own beer or wine. It's only when you start selling it that you need a license. So we want to see unlicensed personal cultivation. We want to see unregulated hemp. Right now, you look at the industrial hemp market out there, and in Canada, in Europe, they're limited to less than 1% THC, in some cases half of a percent THC in their plants. What they do, and that's why the petrochemical industries really allow that and support it, because what they do is they breed out the THC, and by breeding out the THC, they breed out the flowers. By breeding out the flowers, they're breeding out the seeds, and that's the food and the protein that hip should be making. And when we restore it to its natural place, we're going to see a boom for all of our farmers, for all our local economies, and the decentralization of wealth as it should be, I think. So that's the dream, and that's what we're working for, to restore industrial hemp and to help medical marijuana patients. And I think, you know, we've got our clinics, and they've done a lot to help us get this thing going, but I look forward to the day when our clinics are put out of business by legal marijuana and unregulated industrial hemp, and that's what we're working for. We're working to make it where our clinics basically don't have a job anymore because people can grow their own without a license, and uh, that'll be a happy day, and we're going to keep working toward it.